this is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me is my co-host, Barbara Hinsky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft of writing and the business of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest today is Susan DeFreitas, who is an award-winning author, editor, and book coach. And she's with us today to talk about how to know whether you are starting your novel in the right place. And Barb and I were talking about this even before we started recording, because we've both had experiences after writing that discovering we needed to change that up. So Susan, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So I am constantly reading about story theory, book things, um, and I've been querying lately, and there's so much emphasis on the first few pages. And sometimes I get frustrated about it because it seems like people want your first few pages to be better than any of the rest of it. But then I realize <laughs> you might only get those first few pages. If you don't get that right, um, you don't get <laughs> to, you know, the reader doesn't let you give them, I'm messing this up. You don't get their attention for long enough for the rest of it. So it's not that it needs to be better. It's just that it needs to be right. Um, so let's start with this. What, what do those first few pages need to do? And I know that's a super open-ended question with <laughs> probably a lot of answers. So, but what do we need to do as authors in those first few pages? You know, number one is to get the basics right. And this may seem obvious to your sophisticated, uh, you know, audience here, but as someone who has been a reader for contests, as who has judged anthologies, who has been on the committees with, you know, small presses to pick their next novels, there are plenty of uh, authors and queries that come through with uh, quite um, accomplished uh, author bios. And yet they're sort of bombing the basics on the first page, right? So what are the basics? The basics are a clear point of view. Who are we? Whose head are we in? You know, and I always say that at the beginning of a story, and this is true even when you take a section break and change point of view, the reader is like a little baby duck and the first person they see they think is their mother, <laughs> right? So that <laughs> means the first named character that we see on the page, we tend to think, okay, well, that's who I am, right? So you want to be aware of that because sometimes that's not what writers intend at all. They're in somebody else's head, but they're talking about someone else and it's the first named character. That can work, but but it basically can only work if we if you correct our mistaken assumption in sentence number two, mm. yeah. right? Because you don't want your reader to go even another sentence or two under the mistaken impression, right? We cannot orient ourselves to the story if we do not know who we are in it. Number two on the basics is where are we? What is happening? Opening with interiority is a wonderful way to start. It gets us in point of view. It gets us a feel for the voice of the uh, protagonist, the character, how they think and all that. But we don't want to go too long before we acquire a body, <laughs> you know, in <laughs> space and time. Because there's sort of just this like free floating. I mean, unless unless you're opening in a very literary way where it's going to be a whole bunch of, you know, um, biographical summary, which with a strong, strong emphasis on voice, you know, this is like how Donna Tart opens the Goldfinch. But are you Donna Tart? <laughs> and are you writing the Goldfinch? You know, and beyond that, you know, that's not even her first book. There are are a lot of demands placed upon debut writers because we, you know, they've not yet demonstrated their stuff. 
and that they have a readership. We want to get in the body. We want to get into a scene. We want to know where we are and what's happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is something I find that people, again, even folks who are very good writers, they often forget this. And I consider this one of the basics, which is what are we doing there? Mm -hmm. You know, Lisa Cron, who has done so much to um, explicate the neuroscience between behind um, reading stories, right? The reader's experience of story based on how the human brain works. She points out that if we don't know why somebody is doing what they're doing, if we don't know what they're trying to accomplish, that's just a basic split from us in point. We cannot inhabit their -hmm. point of view Mm -hmm. if we don't know what they're doing, because we as human beings, we don't do things for no reason. You know, even if you're engaging in, in light, you know, banter around the water cooler with a, a coworker, you probably, you know, have an unconscious urge to pass the time or to, or to, you know, to Mm -hmm. cement a friendship or to put off going back to the thing you don't want, you know? So it's really a basic part of the opening of a story is understanding not only where we are, but what we are doing there, why the, the character is there. So those are all things that I consider the basics. And, you know, I'd be happy to move on from here to, to the, um, what the further strength, let's say, (laughs) you know, because the basics are what show your competence. And then this next level is what distinguishes your work from other basically competent openings. Well, and I, I'd like to hear that because I do think gone are the days where people, readers say to each other, oh yeah, it took me 50, 50 pages or a hundred pages to get into the book. And then I really liked it. But no, I won't, uh, as a reader, I won't give you 50 pages. I won't even give you 10 pages. And I think that's where we are now. Our, we can yammer you know, endlessly about the lack of attention span of people and myself included, but that's where we are. So uh, I agree with everything you've said so far. So Phyllis, give us some more of that, uh, sketch in more of the details on that. Okay. So the next level things, right. Um, tension, some kind of tension, Mm -hmm. a sense of some trouble, (laughs) you know, all is not well. Um, I have written on Jane Friedman's blog about how people often interpret that advice too broadly and take it to mean they need to open with an explosion or an argument or a car chase. Those things are really quite meaningless if we don't have any attachment or understanding uh, to or of the people involved, you know? Um, But tension, tension is not necessarily over conflict at all. You know, to give an example, one of my um, coaching clients' novels opens with um, a wedding scene, right? It's um, to, uh, um, well, one is a, a Indian American and the other is a globetrotting Indian national. But these are modern people of East Indian descent who have chosen to uh, go forth with an arranged marriage, right? And in his original opening, it was all sunshine and flowers and marigolds and gold and glory, right? And it was aesthetically very rich and very beautiful. But, you know, part of the advice I gave to him there is like, you have to concentrate right out of the gate on, oh my God, what have I done? Yeah. What am I doing? You know, Mm -hmm. am I crazy? Is this all going to go sideways? Because that's what makes a story interesting, right? We don't, we're not interested in in reading a story about perfect people in a perfect world. You know, it's like, hey, well, good for you, right? It's it's (laughs) not. 
<laughs> There's no story in that, right? Yeah. And so the tension can be, like you said, it doesn't have to be conflict. There doesn't have to be a gunfight breakout. It can be as subtle or as simple as somebody being uncomfortable with a decision they have made mm-hmm. or or going to make or an argument or like it can it's nuanced and it can take many forms um but it has to be something that that drives interest because like you said everything being just really swell and you know like 1950s television america is it's not engaging no. and no. here's the thing too like different sources of tension some are more high value to your story than others okay because opening with the tension that somebody feels talking to their neighbor who just yammers on and on and on and on. Mm. I mean, that's tension, but it's so what tension that this person can walk away from this conversation and, you know, their lives will, we assume, continue in a rather even keeled fashion. But the tension of feeling on your wedding day that you may have made a grave mistake high stakes yeah right well let me ask you this um on on the other end of tension in the form of conflict um you know we have movies like james bond and mission impossible that open with a great deal of exterior tension Yep. um and particularly with james bond you have you know that opening hook And But that scene may stand alone in that it doesn't really tie into, other than it involving the main character or a couple of main characters, it may have no other relationship to what happens in the rest of the story. It's just that cold opening that's exciting. Um, Has taste and appeal for that changed? Um, Do you, what is your advice as far as doing a cold opening like that that's exciting? but doesn't necessarily um, coincide with what happens in the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. My answer to that is know your genre. Mm. Mm-hmm. Thrillers uh, demand uh, high stakes, fast opening. You know, if if you open a thriller without a sense of impending danger, that is not necessarily going to be to the taste of that readership, right? Uh, whereas, you know, if you're writing a literary novel, women's fiction, you know, even commercial fiction, anything that has a more character um, driven uh, basis, that kind of opening is going to feel kind of <laughs> schlocky, you know, because what we're coming to those genres for is character, right? And I would say, you know, people have this, there's an edict or a saying, you know, or a a well-worn piece of creative writing advice, which is to start as close as possible to the inciting incident. And, you know, I've written on Jane Friedman's blog how people really tend to misinterpret that because what uh, because of not really understanding what as possible means i mean we're the gods of our own little universes right of course it's possible to start with the inciting incident on page 1 so you know that's better right not necessarily because if we don't know who our protagonist is or have a reason to care about them and we don't understand the context into which this inciting incident arrives to throw everything off kilter, Mm -hmm. we can't really understand what it means. So even in movies, which are the form of storytelling that tend to put the highest premium on action, 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 kind of there regardless of, of genre, right? Even there, you know, I was just talking to a screenwriter the other day, movies don't tend to start with the inciting incident. They start with an establishing shot. They start with a a series of interactions that shows you who this person is in their regular life, 
shows mm -hmm. you some of the problems in their regular life, right? Because we're only interested in people with problems and gives us some of the context of the world before that big thing arrives to throw everything off course. So again, thrillers are the exception to this. And in movies and in uh, novels, thrillers are are the, um, or crime novels or even mysteries, they often do start with the inciting incident, which is usually somebody being killed or some great bad thing happened. But even so, then they backtrack, mm. right? To give us just exactly what I shared with you. You know, the sorts of, of sequences that are going to show us who this person is, why we should care about them and what their world is like. So, you know, and, and you were saying um, about, you know, what about the ones that start with action that's not necessarily tied to the main action of the story to come? Well, again, for somebody like James Bond, that is a day in the life. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, you know, so, like, oh, go ahead, Barb. I was just going to say, it's interesting how you set that up because if I'm watching a lot of BritBox have been since the pandemic and a lot of Acorn TV and those British crime dramas, um, I mean, you know, at two minutes and 17 seconds, there will be a body. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, they have got that down, but there, it's interesting as a writer to watch those how they you know get bring the body on the stage and of course in a series you've already got some connection to the characters but it's very interesting how they build all that maybe they'll have a crime and then they fade to the main characters who are dropping off their kid at school and they've forgotten a backpack so they establish some of those things that quickly let you care yeah or there's a reason i mean not that you shouldn't care that there's a body in an alleyway but the but let's be honest, you just don't. You don't. No, yeah. until you care about the person whose story it is. Yeah. The the however dramatic, dangerous, or conflict ridden the events of the story, they don't have any interest for us. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's kind of interesting, you know, just in terms of human psychology. But yeah. you know, you consider a a novel like um Oh, one of my favorite literary thrillers, uh, Midnight at the Bright Ideas Bookstore, right? It's, you get to the inciting incident by the end of the first chapter, which is absolutely the convention um, in that genre, right? But again, the inciting incident is the bookseller coming upon a man, a young man who's hung himself in a section of the bookstore, right? And she could easily have had that page one. Mm. Yeah. It isn't page one. You know, there's enough pages for us to understand who this bookseller is, you know, her family relationship to books, to understand, you know, these special different patrons who come to the store, who sort of live there, who are all kind of quirky characters that she calls book frogs, right? And her kind of special relationship with one of them before she comes into that room and it's that young man who's hung himself, right? So again, it's not that it isn't quick, but that's what as close as possible starting as close as possible really means yeah. it means however long it takes you to establish what it is that's going to make us understand what the inciting incident actually means to mm -hmm. the protagonist that could be three pages right in the in a story mm -hmm. like that or <laughs> as in donna tarts the goldfinch it could be 30 pages mm -hmm. right but yeah it, and I it's think, you know, that long. It, as folks are listening to this, or when I was reading your article, it can feel like there is so much that I have to do. <laughs> but part of the magic of writing and is that you don't have to do it all in the first pass. You know, in that first draft, you can establish the context. And maybe that's 
maybe that's what you really accomplished there is, you know, and then you come back and look at it and say, okay, well, we've got this situation, but what's, you know, we have the setting, but what's the problem? And then you come back and realize mm -hmm. I need to more firmly establish the voice and the protagonist. And, you know, it feels like there is so much to do and it has to be done immediately. And those things are true, but they don't have to be done immediately by you. They just have to be done by the time a book is in front of the reader. That's right. And it's so easy for newer writers to just beat themselves up yeah. looking at published work versus this schlock that they keep, <laughs> you know, how they keep falling short of that mark. But what you, you don't realize is that you are looking at the product of so much revision, you know, it has that smooth, immersive, easy to read. You know, they say, was it Mark Twain? It's like, uh, easy reading is hard writing. Mm. <laughs> that might actually be um, Vonnegut, um, another funny guy. But uh, yeah, you absolutely don't have to do it all in one pass. And the other thing that I think I was just discussing this on a call with um, students in a class I'm teaching right now called Final Draft, which is all about the final work to bring your work to market. And one of my students was saying that it's not so much that the opening is a buffet where you're spreading all the delights of the story out before the person. It's more like a course meal. You know, where you start with an amuse-bouche and you move to the soup and then to the salad. And it's it's about each piece of information being intriguing enough and and pulling us into the the protagonist's mind and story enough that we want the next, right? Mm -hmm. And another student was bringing up, she's an information architecture, this concept of uh progressive revelation it's not revelation progressive information where it's about supplying what the reader needs to know at each point and in so doing building a big and complex picture but not starting with a big and complex picture right so i always say yeah. when i'm working with people on their opening pages one thing clearly at a time please mm -hmm. right that is how you build a complex and nuanced picture not by starting with a complex and nuanced thing you're mm -hmm. trying to get across all right so i in the summer finished writing my fifth novel which barb is actually reading right now and realized after some feedback that i hadn't started it in the right place at least for that genre and so i restructured some of the chapters so that you start in the middle of things because uh, it's a thriller suspense murder mystery kind of story um and so i just you know i took those first couple of chapters which were essential for setting some things up and just move them back so that on those first few pages like it's total chaos um mm -hmm. that hopefully you're getting one thing at a time within the mm -hmm. chaos but it's it's chaotic um, when you're working with a writer and, and y'all come to the realization that this isn't starting in the right place, what are things that writers can look for to remedy that? Uh, again, you need to know what the inciting incident of your story is. And then from there, really ask yourself, what does the reader need to know in order to understand this event, right? If it's a long lost relative or an estranged one showing up at the door, it would certainly be helpful to know, to have some of the background on why these two haven't spoken in 30 years, 
right? Mm-hmm. Delivered in a sideways way, not in an info dumpy way, right? Just in the, woven into the context of this person's life as the story opens. But again, if, you know, if dear old dad shows up and our default uh, thought is like, well, anybody would be happy to see their father show up at their door unexpectedly. And that is not true in this story. You need enough information before that event happens for us to understand how this is different, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, If in that scenario, this uh, character has worked hard to distance herself, say, from the hard scrabble, perhaps even on the edge of what's legal childhood that this parent created for her, then you probably want just enough there before he shows up to see her beautiful life that she's created for herself as a lawyer or some, you know, professional enough information there for us to understand that she didn't come from this, you know, Mm -hmm. that she made this world for herself and she's fiercely proud of it. Right. So again, what it, it's not like they need to know everything before that inciting incident, but ask yourself, honestly, what gives this event the inciting incident it's emotional power Mm -hmm. right because that's back backstory we need to understand and two what is the context that we need to understand in order to understand how this event is going to upset and create trouble in this person's life right and again that might depending on your inciting incident depending on your genre that might take you two pages it might take you ten you know, but that's about how much opening you need before that inciting incident occurs. Well, I think that is a perfect place that just really wraps up all that we've been talking about. Um, And so let's end the conversation there because it's practical and concise. And that's my favorite way to end things. Um, But before we go, I know you do classes, you do book coaching. Um, so I want to make sure you give people an opportunity to know where to find you um, so they can see what you're doing. Absolutely. So you can find me at my website, which is susandefreitas.com. And I really encourage people to sign up for my newsletter. It's called The Big Idea. I really pride myself on providing a lot of super useful information for writers for free, whether or not you ever choose to work with me. And uh, when you sign up for my newsletter, you'll receive a free ebook I wrote. It's called Cracking the Code, uh, 10 Critical Craft Techniques That Will Get Your Novel Published. And again, it's designed to deliver a lot of very practical, actionable advice in a very clear, straightforward manner. (laughs) I'm a story geek, but I'm also the daughter of an engineer. I like things that make sense. I think there's a lot of creative writing advice that is just a dozen, (laughs) frankly. Um, And I see way too many very talented writers fail to get their first novel published, fail to achieve a lifelong dream of becoming an author just for the lack of one or two things on this list, Mm. right? So I encourage people to um, sign up, to download that ebook and to sign up for my mailing list. And give your... Give that website again or where we go. It's just susandefreitas.com. Okay. And I will include that in the show notes, both on the podcast version and the YouTube version. So that will be easily found. And um, thank you so much. One of the things that drew me to want to have this conversation was, you know, the practical nature and implementable nature of, you know, your article that I read. And I think that, you know, when we have story ideas that 
aren't easily implemented, that's not very useful. And so I appreciate your perspective and the conversation with you today. Yeah, this is great. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I'll be signing up. Yep. Same.